Good morning. And what a powerful day we had yesterday. What a powerful start. Can we please give a big hand to all of us for what we created together yesterday? Big hand, big hand. Very beautiful, very powerful uh, beginning. And I kept listening uh, when I had people coming up here. Uh, is Akima still with us? I kept hearing her talk of African liberation. And in my head, I was saying, so what do we want? And the answer came as African liberation. And I want us to, to chant it as a slogan. I want to invite you into a slogan. What do we want? What do we want? When do we want it? What do we want? When do we want it? And I'm going to invite just three very lucky movements that have an agenda that is reducible to a slogan. Let me start with Rachel. What does your movement want? Like, this is, yeah, these are radical times. <laughs> these are very radical times. Okay, what, what, please speak into the microphone. <laughs> What, what does your movement want? We want pussy power. <laughs> All right. What do we want? Now. We want when do we want it? All right. I think I saw Muhammad yesterday. Well, I mean, anyone, anyone, anyone who, who has a, a movement agenda that is reducible to a slogan. Courage, courage, courage. What are your movements working on? Right there, Deck. Deck is right there. What do we want, Deck? We want uh, social justice. Sorry, come again. Social justice. What do we want? When do we want it? What do we want? When do we want it? Thank you. And um, the, the other thing, just before I get into bringing our um, uh, main moment uh, that I carry from yesterday, is that as much as we had, I think Ebrima said it, that we stand on this verge of a most consequential moment. Uh, when I listened to people who spoke yesterday, it occurred to me that the task is not only to innovate and create and come up with something new, but a big part of our task is to remember. Is to remember. And our struggling, whether it's remember just one word or it's remember. Because we are the same people, we are the same community that has known that whatever the question is, community is the answer. We are the same people who know that community means solidarity. Community means connection. Community means relationship. Community means power. Community means togetherness. Community means moving forward together. So a big part of it is just us remembering. We are the same ones who have known how to fight wars when we needed to fight wars that were just. We are the same people who have known how to make peace when we needed to make peace. But today these are all very elusive issues, very elusive questions. But we've known how to do this. We are the same people who have known how to heal broken bones just using mud and twigs and grass in the bush without the sophistry of modern medication. So a big part of it is just us remembering who we are, remembering where we have come from, remembering what we can achieve when we center community. So thank you. Thank you for inspiring yesterday. A big hand to all of us. Thank you. It was a very inspiring conversation. Now my task, my official task, 
is to introduce our keynote speaker. He tells me that uh, he is here by accident. It's through sustained, continuous, connecting accidents over decades that he is here with us today. He had wanted to do anthropology research in Ethiopia, and a war happened. Somalia invaded Ethiopia, those who remember the Ogaden War. So he couldn't work where he wanted to work. And as part of what was happening around that time, UNHCR, Oxfam, were involved in programs to support the uh, repatriation and rehabilitation of refugees. So someone came up with a very brilliant idea that, they, that was known as the rehabilitation package. And this was a package that was being offered to refugees that had to be repatriated and rehabilitated uh, as a result of this war. And in the package, the proposal was to give everyone one goat, one sheep, one cow, and one donkey. Don't even stress yourself too much in trying to unpack it. <laughs> but when he came into the equation, he uh, became part of a process that managed to communicate to very well-intentioned people who wanted to do this, rehab this rehabilitation that this is not what people wanted. And this is not something that was going to work. I'm told actually Somalis don't even know what a donkey is. There are, not, there are no donkeys there. Uh, and if they are to have a goat, one goat is not that helpful. You need at least 10, you need 15, 20. So he lived in a refugee camp for weeks, talking to people, the affected refugees. And they are the ones who said, this is not what we would want. And he was then invited to propose something that would work. After that, lots of things happened. He's at the Van Leer Foundation, Bernard Van Leer Foundation. And after that, well, this I must pause for a second on it. Because again, the Bernard Van Leer Foundation invited him to come and assess the work that they were doing, uh, supporting the liberation movement in South Africa. And his response and feedback to them was that it was again removed and separated from what people wanted and what people needed. And they gave him a job. They said, come on board and uh, you are now working here. Come on, help us come up with a solution that works. After that, he meets the one Natalia Kanem, who was then the Ford rep in West Africa and whose life doesn't change when you meet Natalia. Right? And it's Natalia who then hires him to be the, Ford, the director and representative of Ford Foundation in Southern Africa. And from that, uh, when he was the Ford representative in Southern Africa and the director in Southern Africa, he became part of the generation that created what we know today as Trust Africa. And their proposition was that those who are closest to problems, those who are most affected, those who are most oppressed, must be at the center of creating solutions to the challenges that we are seeking to confront, which is the story that you see throughout, from that whole Ogaden story all the way down. After that, he went on to become the CEO of the uh, Europe Foundation Center, which is now Philia. 
and he has gone on to sit on several advisory boards, several boards of trustees, including today sitting on the advisory council of the Center for African Philanthropy and Social Investment, Becky's uh, institution, where he's an advisor and he teaches two postgraduate courses at the University of Vitz. He is also serving as the strategic advisor for the Africa Europe Foundation. And the last thing that I'll say as I bring him on the stage, I asked him throughout, it sounded like you were contrarian. You met UNHCR and Oxfam and you told them what you have proposed does not work because it's not informed by the voices of the people. You went to Bernard Van Leer, again you told them what you're proposing does not work because it's been cooked up from an intellectual point of view, it's not organic, it's not coming from the ground. So I asked him, what did you say that made you memorable and unforgettable when you met Natalia? And he says, I don't know. He doesn't remember. <laughs> But somehow, several years later, she went back to look for him, and she hired him to be the director for Ford Foundation in Southern Africa. My dear colleagues, please, a very big, big welcome to our dear brother, Jerry Salol, who is our keynote speaker for this morning. Jerry, we are so honored. We are truly honored. Please, <laughs> please. Briggs. I, I, I call Briggs, Briggs, stop the bleeding bomber. <laughs> and you know why. This is better? Okay, uh, that means I can move. Let me start with this. Uh, I was thinking last night what I wanted to say, and I remembered my grandmother. My grandmother was a formidable storyteller. She could entertain children and adults in the same company by telling the same story but speaking to different levels of the audience at the same time. She had sexual innuendo, she had adventure, everything in the same story and just the way she delivered stories made people want to come and spend the night in our house so they could hear my grandmother tell stories. She was an amazing Oh. She was an amazing storyteller. And one thing I was thinking about last night was she was very good at d d doing one thing. She translated the world into two categories, us and them. All her stories were about us and them. And funnily enough, the end of the story had a very ritualized ending. The story was never the same twice. It was different every time. Even the same story got told differently. But the ending was ritualized. And the ritually, I mean, I, I don't want to offend anybody, but the, the ending was the following. Well, they lived happily ever after, and we remained with shit in our teeth. OK, so just to give you an idea of, of, of the subversiveness of this woman's storytelling, because she gave you a sense of community, but she also gave you a sense of what the opposition was about. And she did define the world into us and them. And of course, all communities do that. We're doing that all the time. So I just thought yesterday, when you give me uh, the topic of people and power, I immediately thought of us and them. We don't have the power. They have the power. We are the people. They are not the people. And of course, it's not like that. Uh, I'm sorry, somebody's speaking to me. Oh. Oh. <laughs> I thought it was my grandmother for a minute. <laughs> Breaking you know, traditional rules. Um, let me start by saying what a great privilege and honor it is to be addressing this group. And I had written a speech, but I have dispensed with it, partly because of some of the things that happened yesterday, and I will explain. But also, 
because I'm really speaking to a group of brothers and sisters. Literally, I'm talking to what I consider my peers, not people I can teach or educate or inspire, because you are, many of you, my mentors. Natalia, Akwasi, Becky, Jacob. These are people who I take advice from, get instruction from, Ibrima. Uh, I can't sit here and pretend that I can say something to you that's different or better or new. And more importantly, I heard yesterday a lot of the things that, in fact, uh, I was going to say. So what else is new under the sun? In Amharic, we have a saying, and it's under the sky. There are no new things. So I don't have anything to offer you that's new, but I do want to say what a privilege and an honor, and uh, you're obliged to listen to me. So this is the deal. I've recently come to some kind of uh, what old men like me do is in Amharic, they think and they remember. Thank you, Briggs. They remember. And I've been trying to piece together things that bother me. I'm not sure I have the answers, but I'm going to suggest some things to you, and I'd like your feedback. Because either I'm going crazy, and that's possible. Or I am beginning to see some things, some patterns, that I want to share with you today. And uh, this topic of people and power lends itself very much to this. Um, so with no further ado, with all protocols observed and, and all that, let me just please make a pact with you. This isn't a speech to an audience. I'm sorry I'm here and you're there. Us and them. I want us to be part of a discourse, and I want feedback, and I want criticism, and I want you to tell me if I've got it wrong. And it's perfectly possible that I don't understand anything, and I am just seeing things and patterns where they don't exist. But let me just throw a couple of things out at you. Um, I have been in love with uh, the idea of burial associations, rotating credit associations, all my life. I, my field work in anthropology, my uh, initial work on ethnicity was all about looking at what people do to organize for themselves. And one particular example, in Ethiopia in 1961, 1961 a group of uh, people living in an area called Walamo realized that if they had built, if they could build 60 kilometers of asphalt road, they could get produce to market to Addis Ababa and they could sell it at a better price. These are ordinary peasant farmers who pooled resources, gathered money, collected money, put together resources, and built in the space of something like nine months, a asphalt road by ordinary people, uh, rural people, to join the main uh, asphalt road uh, to Addis. They call themselves the Walamo Alamgana Road Construction Association. And they brought in a lot of money. Not only did they bring in a lot of money, after they finished the road, they had other money to do other things and they began doing them. And what do you think happened? The government took notice of them, and the government began to get very nervous about people power. <laughs> and very quickly, a n narrative emerged that these were ethnic secessionists and this, that, and the other. But in fact, this was a group of ordinary people with agency who decided to do something for themselves. And rotating credit and burial associations are the foundation, I think, of African society across the board, from Cape to Cairo, from Dakar to Djibouti. You will find that women, mostly, are keeping and preserving these incredibly powerful, powerful uh, organizational mechanisms to keep people going. Um, we have reduced them to 
something that I think is astonishing in the way we describe them, because we call them survivalist activities, or we call them the coping mechanisms of the marginalized. But we haven't recognized the power that ordinary people have in pooling resources and in making things happen. And so when people talk to me about African philanthropy, I'm always translating it to something that already exists. So this brings me to the issue of agency. And I have a problem. I, I'm sorry if I'm provoking, but then again, I'd like your feedback. But I have a problem with the way we use the word agency, because we imply in the way we use it that it's something that we can give to somebody. Agency is not conferred. If I can paraphrase Shakespeare, in, he has a wonderful feminine hero who goes um, to defend Shylock, and, he, and, she, and she says something like, uh, you know, mercy is a quality that is not strained. Well, actually, agency is, an agent, is, a, is a concept, is a, is a power, is an asset that is not delivered to somebody, it's not given to anybody. Agency exists, it's in part in the fabric of the DNA of, of, of people on this continent and in other continents. Agency is something you have, and it's something you need to be empowered, perhaps is a funny word, um, because it uses this word power, but you need to be not hindered from using your agency. But your agency is yours, and no one can give it to you, or indeed, really take it away from you. But maybe you think differently, and I'd like to hear, but I don't think agency is something that can be conferred. But power is, a very, is another thing. People do have power. There is people power, as I've described. But it's no longer fashionable for donors to be able to say, it's my money, I'm giving it to you, you do what I tell you to do. But we have a whole world of uh, rules, mechanisms, agreements. We've gotten into this context where we are now negotiating partnerships with beneficiaries and so on. But negotiated partnerships for me are problematic because they take away agency. They take away spontaneity. And so recently, I think we've witnessed in COVID and possibly in the Ukraine war, two examples where the black swan was not seen, people were not ready for the unexpected. It happened. And the contractual arrangements that, agree, that had been agreed did not allow or did not permit people to react spontaneously to what was happening. And I think the philanthropic community, if we can use that word, uh, did do pro perform amazing things during this period. But it also met the limitations of what it can do under the current schema of contractual relationships and obsession with reporting, with TDIs, with all the rest of that. There is a real problem, I think, in spontaneity. So when we say, and, and this is where I really need your support, and I think we need to create movements that say this, uh, I have seen very successful movements in our industry on special things. I know people who will not sit on a panel if a woman is not on that panel. I know people who will not uh, uh, take part in something that is not something that they think is ethical. We have managed that in our industry. I think we should also begin to call out the, I call it jargon cladding. Um, there's too much jargon cladding in our business. We, 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 we give something a name, and because then we use that language, it's like if we've solved the problem, right? And this is, I think, something we really need to do. We need to call each other out when we use language inappropriately, and when we use jargon cladding to pretend we are decolonized or uh, whatever it is, when we are not. And I'm asking you, please, not to allow ourselves, this is our community, us, not to make the mistake of using jargon to cover up 
actually not being able to live up to the promise. And I think that's, that, is, there, that is a real risk. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about another kind of jargon, which is the jargon of uh, localization, if I may. I mean, uh, Briggs said it so much better than I could. Localization has been with us a long time. When I first worked in this industry, uh, um, you heard how I got into it accidentally. Everybody understood that having people who spoke the language, who lived in the community, who were from the community, were the ones who had the answers. It's not like anybody ever said, no, that's not true. They all agreed, and when you show them that, people agree. The problem is we don't have the mechanisms to allow people to genuinely, authentically, not as tokens, in other words, be able to present a perspective that is their own. And I think this is the biggest challenge, because it's just simply too easy when you're speaking this kind of sophisticated language that we do, to forget that actually people have the answers. They may not use the same language, but they do have the answers, they do have the, the, the concepts. And I find it extremely difficult to, to accept, let me, let me, this is a bias, so, you know, I find it very difficult to accept that we're in a new phase where localization means something new. The colonialists, when they colonized this continent, if you read uh, Rodney uh, and, and how Europe underdeveloped Africa, you will see that colonialism understood localism very well. There is absolutely nothing new about recognizing that people on the ground know better. But we have systematically and continually found ways of obstructing that, partly because of language, partly because of sophistication, partly because of jargon, but partly because at, our, at the core, and again, this is a bias, at the core of our industry, we have many, many, many people who are at their core. They're not bad people, they're not cruel people. They think they have the answers. They are social engineers. They have the answers. They have the answer in their pocket. They carry it with them. How can you ask that person to listen to somebody who doesn't use the language that they have? And that's the challenge. And yesterday when, I, I have to say, I, I was bowled over by the keynote speech yesterday. Uh, it was very powerful because the language that was being used was the language of capacity building. And I had come with my own bias, hostility to the word capacity building. I can't stand the word, to be honest, because it always it always puts you in a position where you are assuming you know something, you have a secret, you have something, and you can help somebody else gain capacity. What an insult. What an insult. And I was coming to the speech with that kind of an attitude. And I said, you know, I said later to, to Mamadou, I had a moment of, of aha because he was talking about a very different kind of capacity building. He was talking about capacity building of us, not them. He was talking about capacity building of the professional, not the unschooled, unwashed. He was talking about the capacity building of us, because we need capacity building to be able to interpret what is going on on the ground. That's what I got from yesterday's keynote speech. And I thought, my gosh, that has helped me. Because yes, I believe in education. Yes, I believe in knowledge. But that knowledge has to be applied in a particular place. It cannot be that you are assuming that you have something to offer somebody else. And I thought that keynote speech, I will carry that. And uh, I look forward to reading the written version of it. But it was a very important uh, lesson. And then we had something happen yesterday that also blew me away, and I have to recognize it. Sometimes it's good not to plan too much. And yesterday we had a very African meeting. We had to wait. We, we waited. We were patient. We knew there were protocols that needed to be observed. We also needed to occupy our time. 
And what did we have? We had a master rapper with us. Okay? And Ali, Ali just blew me away. What did he do? He told us what we had been saying in a f few minutes with talking about our capitals and all the cities. He created an us community in, a, in the space of about five minutes. So, Ali, thank you very much for what you did yesterday. I'm here representing the Africa Europe Foundation, which is also something that you know uh, is a new foundation. But it's a new foundation that's trying to occupy a very special niche. And it's a very special niche because it's really trying to make sure that the relationships between the EU, the European Union, and the African Union are equitable and real. That's really an important thing because we're going to need policy and we're going to need governance and we're going to need serious input from these institutions at some point. And the Africa Europe Foundation has, is doing many different things. It's working on climate change, it's working on health, it's uh, working on carbon transfer, it's working on space, African space, would you believe? It's working on a whole range of different things. So if you want to hear more about what it's doing, please talk to me or to Andrej, who is in the room representing the Africa Europe Foundation. But I wanted to just say one thing about what it's doing that I think really matters and civil society needs to help. And therefore, I hope you can give us your cards and so on so we can begin to reach out to you. One of the things it's trying to do is to monitor the fulfillment of commitments being made by the EU and by the African Union to each other at their summits. This is the way to hold people accountable for promises made on our behalf. And so civil society needs to recognize that this space is being occupied and it needs to help an institution like the Africa Europe Foundation work. Now they have a good pedigree. One of the organizations behind Africa Europe Foundation is a foundation you all know very well, the Mo Ibrahim Foundation. And one of the things that the Mo Ibrahim Foundation has done that I have found extraordinary in the last 10 years has been to take the index that they created around governance and make that index something that African intellectuals African think tanks, African specialists, African scientists are the ones who are actually adding to the index and adding every year new and better indicators and collecting the data. And frankly, this tool, the African Governance Index, is one of the most powerful tools, I think, for holding African governments to account by African citizens. And so I think African civil society needs to take that into consideration. And having said that, I will just shut up now. Please tell me if what I have said is total nonsense, or maybe there is a grain of truth in there somewhere. Thank you. Another big hand, another big hand, please. Another big hand. I'm informed there are no Q&As, but uh, look up Jerry, let's interact, let's engage. We've got two more days. Thank you so much, Jerry. Please give him a big hand. Give him a big hand. Thank you, thank you. Teresai, it's over to you.